It is interesting when you dive into the longevity research, there seems to be like different camps that are focused on protein restriction, caloric restriction, uh, maintaining muscle mass for the functional longevity of our own physical bodies. Um, yeah. But this changes how we view different macronutrients or how we view our diet and lifestyle. So where do you think we can like strike a balance between growth hormones and activity, but also not doing it, not overdoing it to the point that we might be promoting overgrowth of cells that we don't want proliferating. Um, right. Yeah. If you want to go into that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that um, that's, that's a really hard question to, uh, to, to answer well, in part because um, almost all of the data that we have to extrapolate from comes from studies in laboratory rodents, which, you know, are really, really powerful for uncovering mechanisms and digging into the biology. But I think we have to be really cautious about extrapolating those to the human experience. And so, I mean, you talked about the nutritional studies in, in particular, and you know, this is an area that I've been digging into a little bit um, lately. And I, I, I guess if I had to sort of sum it up in uh, you know a minute, what I would my interpretation of the mouse studies is caloric restriction is robust and usually works, but there are many instances of genetic backgrounds in mice where caloric restriction does not extend lifespan. But that's kind of the best of the nutritional strategies. And then when you start to look at things like protein restriction, intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diet, most of the studies looking at those nutritional interventions are really caloric restriction because the experimental groups are calorically restricted. So people sort of market them as different things, but most of the data is actually caloric restriction. When you then ask if we look at these things like protein restriction, intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diet in an isocaloric setting where now, the, now they're not calorically restricted, there's really very little evidence that you get anything more than maybe a modest effect on, on lifespan or health span. Um, and yet it gets marketed to the general public as if these are really well-established ways to slow aging. So first of all, they're not well-established in mice, at least in an isocaloric setting. Secondly, we have no idea if they're gonna be beneficial in people. They might be. And I, go, and I go back to caloric restriction, where if you look at the one study that looked at the effect of caloric restriction on lifespan across uh, something like 50 different genetic backgrounds, so different mouse strains, um, what they found was that in about half of the mouse strains, caloric restriction actually shortened lifespan, at least at that one level of restriction that they tested. So in the, the only study, and there are lots of imperfections in that study, but in the only study that really tried to do this, you know, uh, well, looking at genetic variation in the context of caloric restriction, half the time it, it either had no effect or it actually harmed the animals from a lifespan perspective. And that's the best data, right? I would be really careful about recommending to people who are genetically diverse and environmentally diverse that they should try something that actually shortened lifespan half the time in a controlled laboratory setting. And yet, you know, I, I think sometimes, it, so I think sometimes the perception gets way ahead of the actual data. So that's a, that's a maybe a long-winded way of saying that um, I don't think, I think that these nutritional studies in aging are super powerful to learn about mechanism. I just think we need to be careful about making recommendations on lifestyle from those, okay? So then what can we conclude? And, and, and here it gets to be a little speculative, but you know, my, I mean, and this is kind of obvious, my take home is we know that, um, we know that too many people eat too much, right? We know that there's an obesity epidemic that leads to greater risk for a variety of diseases. And I think one way that, that some people in the field who like to make recommendations to, to the general public justify that is they say, well, any of these anti-aging diets are better than, than eating McDonald's all the time and being obese, which is probably true. Um, but what's less clear to me is that you're gonna get an added benefit if you are sort of normal weight and active that, that caloric restriction or intermittent fasting or fasting mimicking diet or ketogenic diet, that you're really gonna get a big added benefit as long as you are not overweight and obese and you're you know, moderately to, to, uh, to highly active, right? That, that's sort of my guess. Um, I'm not saying that you won't get any benefit. And the other thing I will say is sort of my personal view on this is that it's not gonna be a one size fits all that we know based on genetic variation and environmental variation, that different people respond very, very differently to the same diet. And I don't think it's going to be the case that, you know, a Mediterranean diet is the best diet for everyone. 
or a ketogenic diet is the best diet for everyone, you know, or, or whatever your, you know, pick your favorite um, bad diet, right? Uh, and so I think that there is a personalized aspect to this that we don't understand yet. Um, the field is making progress on identifying biomarkers that, that might help us to get a, to get a better uh, prognostic way to, to predict who's gonna, who's gonna benefit from different dietary interventions. Um, but I think for now, you kind of, you know, you kind of have to figure out what works best for you to some extent. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it, it feels kind of superficial, but really I think the old advice is still correct. Don't eat too much, exercise regularly. And then I, and I would add to that personally for me, what I found works really well is to really reduce the simple carbohydrates. And, and I, you know, since I've done that, I feel a lot better. Uh, and so I think you kind of have to figure out what, you know, what, what works for you, given your unique genetic makeup and, and the environment that you experience. Yeah. And I want to go, back. I think I also, I also want to add, I don't know that I'm going to live much, you know, a lot longer. And I don't know that I'm aging more slowly from that. It's just what, you know, it's what gives me the best quality of life.